Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. A room without books is like a body without a soul. Hi and welcome to Sundoku. I'm Sarah Martin. And I'm Annie Hastwell. This is the place where there are no guilty pleasures. Whether you read bodice rippers, crime, serious literature, poetry or camera manuals, we will not judge you or ourselves. I have a problem with camera manuals. In the days when we had manuals, I used to love tucking myself into bed with a camera manual. Well, if you didn't study Japanese and you're wondering what sundoku means, it's the word that you can apply to that teetering pile of books beside your bed. You know, the one you promised yourself you'll get around to reading sometime. Give me an idea of what's in your sundoku, Sarah. At the moment, what I like to call my shortened Sundoku, the one by my bed and not the extended version that's spilled out onto a shelf in my wardrobe, it holds Phosphorescence, which is a lovely book about seeking light and positivity written by Dr. Julia Baird. And I'm just needing it for a little bit of a little bit of goodness in my life. And also The Hush by Sarah Foster, which is my next book club read. And it's set in a near future that could be now. It's in the thrall of COVID with new challenges around reproduction and women's rights. Sounds like a dystopia. I love a dystopia. Later in the program, in our classic section, we'll turn our attention to poetry. In case you haven't noticed, poetry is the new black. And we'll be hearing about a poet from the New York School. That was around in the 60s and 70s, Andy Warhol days. This poet, Joe Brainard, was famous for his poems, which all began with the words, I remember. I remember when polio was the worst thing in the world. I remember pink dress shirts and bowler ties. I remember when a kid told me that those sour clover-like leaves we used to eat, with little yellow flowers, tasted so sour because dogs peed on them. I remember that didn't stop me from eating them. But first, Michaela's been working hard to chase down best-selling Australian author Geraldine Brooks on one of her rare visits back to the country. She's been busy, but we trapped her for half an hour. Geraldine's latest book is called Horse, And who ever knew she was so passionate about horses? But she has covered a lot of topics in her time, from the sex lives of Muslim women in Nine Parts of Desire to the bubonic plague, Year of Wonders. So a horse interest isn't all that surprising, I suppose. Michaela grabs some time with Geraldine. I've got many words that I would use to describe your book. It, it's revelatory, it's, um, it's compelling, it's sad, it's joyous. But, but how would you describe horse? It was, it was a passion project for me. It came along at an opportune moment because I discovered horses in midlife. Um, I've always been an animal person, but I never had a chance to have a relationship with a horse. And uh, I had my own horse and I was completely fascinated with her. And then I learned about this story that was right up my alley in the terms of the historical period that it took place in and the themes that I would be able to explore about this 19th century racehorse who had a most extraordinary career and without spoiling anything, a long life because if something bad had happened to the horse, I wouldn't have been able to write this book. <laughs> it would have been rather short. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like uh, stories where it's not a good ending for the animal. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't, we won't spoil it, but you certainly, you, you get to experience the life of this horse, Lexington, but you also get to experience the sort of the cultural afterlife of this horse as well in your book. So it's not set in any one particular time, is it? No, it's a braided narrative that encompasses three time periods. And I knew when I set out that I wanted there to be two time periods. I wanted the historical spine, if you like, of the novel to be the story of the horse itself and his brilliant and long career, 
And I knew I wanted to delve into the science around the horse's bones at the Smithsonian where they resided from shortly after his death until quite recently when they were put on display as pride of place at the International Museum of the Horse where his story is now retold in full. And, and you bring this horse to life, but you also bring these incredible institutions to life as well. I mean, they, they're, they're exciting the way you describe them. Have you visited this, all of these places? Have you been to these attics and, and um, cellars that you were discussing in the book? Absolutely. That's, that's the fun of it for me is having the licence to call somebody up and get into their business, you know. Um, it's just so fascinating, the jobs that people have. And the Smithsonian Institution is a vast agglomeration of very glamorous museums on the Washington, D.C. Mall. But there's an even bigger part of the Smithsonian. It's a bit like an iceberg. Um, the, the Museum Support Centre has 98% of their collections and it's tucked away in rural Maryland on uh, acres and acres of campus where there are all kinds of scientific laboratories and storage pods with everything from old masters paintings to Chinese antiquities to scientific specimens that encompass the genome of every living thing on earth. So it is quite a place and it was really wonderful to be there. And so when I went there to explore the science, I stumbled upon an art story as well because they also have a painting of this horse uh, and the provenance of the painting is quite mysterious. And so that's when I realized the novel would have a third time strand in the 1950s in the world of the modern artists in New York City. In this book, people in the modern day uh, parts of the book, they work in galleries, they work in museums. And the talk sort of centres on on a famous horse, a horse that had been, um, you know, eulogised and painted and and had been put on display in these glass vitrines that you describe, and these people wanted to um, to keep his memory alive. And I'm just wondering, is there a reason why we lament forgetting? Oh, why do Why do we want to uh, remember? I think. Um Initially, it was because this horse was a celebrity. It, it, he, he had a fan base that modern celebrities would envy. Um, presidents came to watch him race. Um, General Custer made a pilgrimage to the farm where he was standing stud because he was thought to be the most perfect example of a horse that had ever lived. So he was a very big deal in the 19th century. And so it's not surprising that he was lauded after his death when he was still in living memory. But then he was forgotten for a while. It's surprising how few people outside of the, the heart of thoroughbred breeding remember him, but um, he was the most successful stud sire in American thoroughbred history. He fathered more champions than any other racehorse. And this at a time when many of his progeny were being taken to be cavalry horses during the Civil War and never never saw a racetrack. Mm. So there would have been even more um, progeny that had his blistering speed and endurance. He really was something. And I think there's a romance that we have um, people for animals. I certainly have it. And I'm a sucker for a great animal story. <laughs> well, it's that and a whole lot more. It really is. And you say it, it, in your book, it became clear to me that this novel could not merely be about a racehorse. It would also need to be about race. Yeah, that's in the afterword. I always like to give an afterword. To I love a good afterword. <laughs> I really do. Well, I think for historical novels too, it's very important to me to tell readers, okay, this is what we know. And this is what I invented. So I come really clean at the end. And I hope that people might be prompted to look further into the real history um, that I've, that I've um, scavenged. But, uh, yeah, no, it, it became clear very, very early that uh, if I was going to write about this horse at all, I would have to write about the extraordinary enslaved black horsemen who were responsible for his early success and for his care and on whose plundered labor the entire thoroughbred enterprise in America was built in the 19th century. It was on the back of the skills and expertise 
of these men who were mostly enslaved or formerly enslaved people. Mm. And the people from that earlier era wouldn't even use the term racist. They didn't think of them to, in, in terms of racism. They wouldn't have called themselves racist. But a lot of the characters did consider themselves to be people of honour. But I think in your book you reveal that they're not. Well, you know, the whole, the whole enslavement system was an epic dehumaniser. Mm. So people treated enslaved Africans as other to them and it was it was completely outside of the norms that they included in their thinking about all their great ideals you know and it's even true in the US constitution you know we th- there's all this talk about about I- equality and freedom and all this highfalutin language and it doesn't apply to you know a large portion of of the population at that time who were just not included in any of those so-called rights. It's a book of perspectives, I would say. There's a quote in there, all the all the ways of seeing, uh, which comes up actually, I think, in a sex scene. It's quite a good sex scene, quite, quite a <laughs> steamy sex scene, I should say. Um, a conversation around John Berger, who I think is an art historian. I actually did um, Google him and start watching his series, which was was very interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I, I have to say I am just in this uh, because I watched uh, the whole ABC ran the John Berger Ways of Seeing series, or I think that was the title of his book. I can't remember quite now. But, you know, he he was quite a radical art historian. Mm. What I drew from that point when you were making it in the book is that all of the relationships in the book do seem to have an element of injustice, so quite often racist, but injustice in them. In American society now, and, and looking back, is it just inescapable if you're going to talk about relationships that there is this all-pervading sense of inequality? Well, you know, uh, it's it's obviously a very different situation in the 21st century to the 19th century. But I live in a community that has been a summer resort for um, affluent black people and even early on not so affluent but one of only two um, beach resorts where black people could swim. So, you know, it's – and that's – pretty close to living memory for a lot of people mm. and um and the community now is a very elite group of filmmakers and judges and harvard professors and and ha- coming to be friends with them you know i have learned that all the education and wealth in the world is not going to protect you from the deep-seated racism in the society and there's a there's a famous example that even people in Australia might know of Henry Louis Gates, who is a summer neighbour of mine, um, who's a Harvard professor and a TV celebrity, and yet he was hauled off his own porch in handcuffs for the crime of trying to open his own front door when he was coming home from a trip because somebody saw a black man trying to get into a house and they called the cops. No, it's, I, I haven't heard that story, but that is unbelievable, yeah. Well, it was a very big deal in the States because of who Mm. he was. Mm. And uh, Barack Obama was president at that time and he invited the cop and Skip Gates to the White House to have a beer and discuss it. But really, I think the cop should have been thrown off the force. Mm. I think, you know, Skip was a little annoyed and expressed that and then the next thing he knows he's being driven off in a police car. And, and you also pick up on the more incidental racism um, in the relationships uh, in, the, in your book. There's a scene where Jess, um, who is white, um, is, sees a man who's unlocking a bike that looks exactly like hers, Theo, who is, who is black, and um, she, she almost accuses him of, of stealing. And she's appalled with herself, but it's that incidental everyday racism that you bring to the fore in that relationship, I think. I think we all have to, you know, really look pretty hard at our own very internalised assumptions. Mm. You know, do I clutch my purse if a black guy gets on the elevator? Do I say blockheaded things to black friends? I've done it, I've done it, I'm so embarrassed you know where somebody tells you something they confide 
a microaggression that's happened to them and you try and say, oh, but do you think it could have been this instead? And then you go, who am I to tell them what their own lived experience is? So I think we all have to do a lot of work. Mm. I'm still doing a lot of work. Well, your, your book is really trying to um, address that. Um, I know I was reading Robin Angelo in her book, White Fragility, and, and she points out that people who don't think they're racist can react in a very brittle fashion if their microaggressions are pointed out to them. Oh, yeah. Everybody says, I don't see race. Well, hello. You might think you don't see race, but you've come up in a society that sees race and it's poisoned the well mm. and you've drunk from that well and, it, it, and it's going to take a lot of work to fix that. Uh, I love a book that teaches me new words and I have to say your book taught me some fabulous new words. I've got to mention a couple. Perseverate. So the, I believe that's when you keep going over something before, over and over again. It's well past being useful but you keep doing that. Perseverate. There was bruited. So when something's bruited about, you're, you're spreading a rumour. Um, you'll have to tell me how to pronounce this one. Rain siling down or siling down? Siling, siling. Well, you know, that snuck in there because that's a Derbyshire dialect word that I learned when I was writing. Year of Wonders. <laughs> but I like it because I think it expresses heavy rainfall. So you heard, you heard it when you were doing Book of Wonders. So um, do you collect words? And if you do, how oh, do you keep them? No, they just they just take root in, in my um, vocabulary. And sometimes it's pretty comical. Um, I found myself, my kids were playing lacrosse in the house, which is a no-no. Uh, and I think a very reasonable no-no. And but they <laughs> were doing fair. it. They were doing it anyway. And I yelled out, "You are vexing me with your ungirt behaviours." <laughs> I think ungirt does come up in the book. I because I, I thought that's the Australian in her girt by sea. Girt by sea. Right. <laughs> um, writers often say that they have um, a framework for their characters, but then once they start to write, the character really starts to take hold and, and take over the over the story. I think I might have heard you mention that in some other interviews. Um, I'm interested in if, if, if a character does take hold of you as you're writing, when you finish writing, do they stay with you? Do these oh, yeah. characters pop up in your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I become very fond of many of them. Some mm. of them I'm glad to show the door, but many of them stick around and... Um, uh, Jarrett sticks around. I feel I feel his presence a lot when I'm with my horse, and doing horse chores, and you know, because he has the relationship with Lexington that I aspire to have with my mare. So yeah, this is the young black groom yeah. Jarrett, whose um, father Harry was the trainer yes. of Lexington, initially. and possibly even the owner at one point. It's it's very unclear in the historical record, but there's. It's indicative, there are certain indicative things that, that he actually owned this horse and had the horse plundered away from him because of his status and not being able to stand up to white power. Yeah. And, um, and you love horses, as you say, so I assume the research for this was an absolute pleasure. It was a pleasure and, it, and it, uh, it was a good thing for the family finances because I wasn't interested in anything else at this period and so <laughs> I wasn't getting other writing done so it was good to have a, a book that I could unite with my passion of the day. Yeah. Well, I'm a little bit suspicious of people who don't like dogs. How are you with people who are scared of horses? Oh, I understand that but I try and I try, I'm, I'm very... Uh, very uh, evangelical and I try and fix that um, by introducing them to my mayor who is a very gentle soul. Um, yeah, no, the, the dog thing, it's a deal breaker for me. <laughs> I'm very suspicious unless there's been a, a good reason like a, an early childhood attack or an allergy or something. If you don't like dogs, I'm going to have a lot of trouble. <laughs> Well, I am scared of horses, and I always, I, I've, I've, I did lessons as a child. I got my children to do lessons. I, I believe in horses in theory, but they, they, their, their sheer physicality, they're, they're, they're capable of so much. I guess I feel intimidated by them. Yeah, but they're intimidated by you too, because mm. they're prey animals, mm. and so they're always looking at what's coming for them. Mm. And so I think what, um, what we read as threatening behaviours by them are really defensive behaviours. So if you start to look at it through their point of view, 
Like, who is this predator jumping on my back? Are they going <laughs> to rip my throat out? And so maybe there, I'm a bit skittish about that. Mm-hmm. And then if you, if you start to think about it that way, that, that they're the vulnerable ones in our relationship, I think that's really helpful. Mm, I'll have to remember that next time I'm, I'm close to one. <laughs> How do you feel about horse racing as a sport? Yeah, no, I'm not. Uh, uh, I think that the issues of equine welfare in horse racing are really pressing and I, it's, it, it's, it's incomprehensible to me that we're still letting so many horses die on the track unnecessarily and that we waste so many beautiful animals, the ones who don't make it as racehorses and who are finished by the time they're five, which is when a horse should first be ridden actually because that's when their bones have settled and that's where you know real um, people who are invested in the life of a horse don't get on them until they're five years old and yet in the horse racing world they're being discarded and many of them can't be retrained for another discipline and don't find homes and they're, they're put to death whereas you know my mare's pasture mate is an off-the-track racehorse his name is Screaming Hot Wings <laughs> and he belongs to my neighbor and he's 33 years old and he still has so much to give yeah. and he's given so much uh, he's taught so many kids to ride and he's been, she says, he's the longest relationship of her life. Uh, so, you know, when you see that, it's just, it's so sad to think of all the horses that won't have that opportunity. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free. And you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Geraldine Brooks talking to Michaela about her latest book, Horse. As we're recording this program, it's Poetry Month in Australia, so we've changed gears for our classic section. Here's well-known Australian poet Ken Bolton talking to Kath about one of his favourite poets, Joe Brainard. The man known for the phrase, I remember. He was a very young artist in New York in 1961. That's when he arrived. He and a bunch of other very young writers, Ron Paget's the best known of his friends, from Tulsa, all arrived together, Tulsa, Oklahoma. In a way, you could make a case that says that they are the nucleus of the second generation of the New York School. I suppose we'd better make clear what the New York School is. Well, there's a New York School of Painting, which is the abstract expressionists and people since then, in the, you know, following de Kooning and Pollock. As a sl- slight joke, one of the galleries that was publishing poetry as well as putting on shows coined the phrase New York School of Poets. And um, so it's a school that everyone says it doesn't really exist, we're not a school, but it's a handy way of grouping them together. They're new, mostly poets from elsewhere who came to New York, very witty, they're usually very sophisticated. The first generation were more or less high-born Americans, you know, um, high achievers, who started writing in the early 50s. John Ashbury, Frank O'Hara, James Schuyler, Kenneth Koch, those people. The second generation, uh, much more middle class and working class and you know, mixed, a mixed bunch, more typical and much more um, post-war baby boomer types in terms of their own culture, much, a lot more TV and stuff. And a uh, few women in that mix. There are. Uh, there's Alice Notley, Anne Waldman, I mean, fewer women. It was still the, the 60s, you know, so it's a male-dominated crowd. A lot of them are gay. And uh, Brainerd was, you know, a visual artist. Uh, he was a, a really terrific graphic artist. His drawings are fantastic. And every second New York School writer, their books have covers by him. Usually he's regarded as a pop artist, but he's not quite one of them. And he was very well known for a while. I mean, he was on the cover of Art Forum once or twice, and that's usually a signal, sort of honour for anybody. He began writing stuff as well, and 
the writers all found it very amusing, uh, mostly because it was so deadpan and pseudo-naive. Just uh, diary entries, I remember. The first book, that was a small book of I Remember, came out, then there was another one called More I Remember, and then there was a More I Remember More. And finally they got collected together and just they're, they're, they're the collected I Remember. The thing about them is that every sentence, and often they're single sentence entries, begins, I remember. And uh, it's funny because you start reading it and once you've done half a page, you don't notice it as a, an annoying mannerism at all um, or a formula. And it does work. Um, he's been copied by lots and lots of people. There's a memoir of by Harry Matthews of George Perec, his friend, all written in that style. It works very well for him there. George Perec himself had read I Remember very quickly, probably didn't even understand how it worked, and did a French version, <clears throat> which is nowhere near as good as Joe's. Lots and lots of other poets have tried to write versions of it, usually in a tribute to um, Joe. And we're awarding it classic status, which it certainly has assumed probably in your mind and for other poets. How would you justify awarding Joe that, that ribbon? Well, I think the fact that everyone else wants to do one demonstrates that he's hit upon something that works very well as a formula, uh, that almost no one thinks they've done one as good as his, so it works best for him. So I think that makes it a classic. My recollection of it is that it's unusual and remarkable for being almost naive in tone, but also completely honest uh, in a honest about sexual matters, honest about his background, honest about culture at the time, in a way that other people weren't being. Yeah, I think that's true. Or if they were, they made a lot of fuss and dance about the fact that they were you know, doing this unusual thing. For him, it's not unusual. Should I read some? I remember the first time I got a letter that said, after five days, return to on the envelope. And I thought that after I had kept the letter for five days, I was supposed to return it to the sender. I remember the kick I used to get going through my parents' drawers looking for rubbers. Peacock. That's the brand, I think. I remember when polio was the worst thing in the world. I remember pink dress shirts and bowler ties. I remember when a kid told me that those sour clover-like leaves we used to eat, with little yellow flowers, Tasted so sour because dogs peed on them. I remember that didn't stop me from eating them. I remember the first drawing I remember doing. It was of a bride with a very long train. I remember my first cigarette. It was a Kent, up on a hill in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with Ron Paget. I remember my first erections. I thought I had some terrible disease or something. I remember the only time I ever saw my mother cry. I was eating apricot pie. It is not like anything else. And again, it's hard to pin down, but it's absolutely charming, isn't it? It is. It's. I used to always remember it as being a bit like a return to leave it to beaver territory. It's that era of the char childhood in the mid to late 50s that he's recalling. So it's full of American product names and um, American habits and culture of the working class, lower middle class kind. The brand names and the products, even when you don't know them or you only know them from American writing, it's terribly nostalgic. I guess it reminds you a little bit in that sense of Andy Warhol, but it's it's rather less self-conscious and mannered. Yes, it, Andy had you know a problem personality with a mask that he wears all the time. Uh, Joe's much less like that, although he's probably taking some lessons from Andy, but Andy hadn't published very much at this stage. I mean, Joe's writing before Andy puts out those more or less famous biographies. So we respond with delight to passages like the one you just read out because we recognise things. How do you think it will have lasted? How do you think a new uh, generation of readers are responding or might respond? Mm, I wonder. I, I think it's still talked about to, amongst poets and they all recommend it to each other. So it's obviously still alive. 
I wonder, the Americans, you know, are usually a decade ahead of us in terms of their progress through their own culture. Maybe the brand names and things are becoming old for them, but I, I, I really don't know. I mean, jokes like the way that he talks about his mother crying and then says, I was eating apple pie, that kind of weird conjunction is going to stay there and still work forever. Okay, well, you don't need to convince me any further about Joe Brainard. Can we still get hold of that book? I think the I Remember book is still around. In fact, I remember I used to run a bookshop, and yeah, it is still around. But the collected writings of Joe Brainard only came out, you know, four or five years ago, I think, from um, the Library of Congress in America. So it's going to be more or less permanently available. With illustrations to boot, and it is a very beautiful book. Yeah, Joe Brainard deserves to be remembered and um, distinguished as a classic. Australian poet Ken Bolton speaking with Kath Keneally. This is Sundoku, the podcast for everyone who considers a novel an essential part of their packing, no matter where they go. My name is Corton and I am 48. I fell in love with books quite young and in a way it was accidental. My parents had decided to travel around Australia and they'd bought a caravan and they asked me if I could pick some picture books to take with me and there was a mix up and I ended up with all the books that I didn't like on our trip around Australia and I remember reading the stories of the Bible and finding this world that was quite harsh but really interesting. Because we moved around a lot, I spent a lot of time by myself. Books were a companion. I'm really drawn to Australian literature. I feel as a country we have been so confronted by our history that we haven't been very honest and literature gives an opportunity to explore and sometimes reveal parts of our history that we never had the opportunity to look at, particularly at school. I listen to a lot of audio books and I found that that's actually enhanced my listening ability in general to be able to tune into one voice. But I love also reading while listening to an audio book and jumping backwards and forwards between the two because you don't get the same insight as you do when you actually read the words on paper and where you see those words as symbols. So they have two different tools, but I spend many hours listening to books now more than I do reading them. If you're keen to share your reading habits and reading past, we'd love to hear from you and get a glimpse of your Sundoku. Send us a voice memo to sundokucast at gmail.com. That's T-S-U-N-D-O-K-U cast at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sarah Martin. And I'm Annie Hastwell. Catch you next time. This podcast is produced by four book addicts refusing treatment. Kath Keneally. Michaela Andreev. Sarah Martin. And me, Annie Hastwell. Our thanks to composer Quincy Grant for the music. If you want to know more about the books and authors featured in this episode, check out the show notes. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at SundokuCast. That's T-S-U-N-D-O-K-U cast. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. 
simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details.